Beneath the fog. Behind the rust. Sometimes they come back. There's only one internationally recognized Mopar master, Mark Warman, joined by his friends, family, and dream team, the Ghouls. Nobody wants to take on the stuff that we take on. Reviving the past. 100% untouched survivor. Resurrecting the icons of American muscle. We are the Shaolin priests of Mopar. Uncovering stories. It's the baddest car we have here. And restoring dreams. The most iconic muscle car on the planet. Putting cars back where they belong. On the road. Here we go. Beyond a passion. Oh, that's wild. One man's obsession. <laughs> With Mopar Perfection, this is Graveyard Cars. Now, a car that I'm really excited about coming through the shop has been here for a long time. It's a very, very, very rare car. Now, we've done some one-of-one -one cars before, certainly. Our 1970 Coronet RT Convertible 426 Hemi from Mr. Trino, one-of-one. We're used to seeing them. What we're not used to seeing, and this was the very first time ever we've had one, 1970 Hemi Cuda. That's rare stuff. Alpine white, beautiful color. Alpine white's a gorgeous color on this car. Automatic, blue interior, and a V02 blue painted roof. We have never done a V02 car in all of our years. We've seen a couple up at the Brothers Museum, but we've never done one. Now, in addition to this car being completely rare and most likely one of one all on its own merit just being a Hemi Cuda with a V02 roof. It also came to us with a couple of urban legends from the owner and he wasn't sure but he says I have heard that that was a St. Louis Blues car. They made a few of those we'll talk about later. He had also heard it was a Sox and Martin car. Both of those requiring the V02 blue painted roof with the alpine white body on it. So when it got here years ago Tony was talking about when when you hey, when do you want me to come out there? Da, 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 I can come out any time there. Got got used to the camera. He loves the camera. Anyway, I had him out and look at four cars with us. Now during this time, it's real quickly, we were changing over cameras, and it turned out that the cameras that we shot an entire episode with wasn't okay for the network, so we had to redo the episode. They wouldn't accept the footage that we had. So we have had in the can all these years a complete episode featuring me and Tony D'Agostino talking about whether this car is a St. Louis Blues car, a Sox and Martin car, or not. Showing the VIN number and the car. There's okay. nothing here that even makes you think it's a Sox and Martin car. I, I see the white body with the blue roof, because I know that that was, you know, typical of their colors. So down the road, we're going to have a very special episode where we find out. Right now, you don't get to know which one it is. Now listen, just one thing to say real quick. Tony's a hater. I've talked about that in the past. He hates everything, right? You know, there's a lot of other options it could have had. How about a six-way seat track? Who'd want it? It's a race car. I don't think Ronnie Sox No, no, no. We're, we're past the point of race car. Uh, that there, you got to prove that there to me. I don't just believe that there or whatever you told me. I don't see any signs of it telling me that it's a Sox and Martin car. It definitely doesn't have any signs of it being a race car. I still am optimistic that the cars very much could be a, a Sox and Martin car. When you're trying to prove something out of the norm, you need to submit proof. Because it's happy and joyous, it's out of the ordinary for you. Because it could be I'd something- I'd be thrilled to know that this was a Sox and Martin race car. Yes! I don't believe you would. So stay tuned for that visit because that was like nothing you ever saw before. A lot of bleeps in that one, a lot of bleeps. As it stands right now, it's a 70 Hemi Cuda, all shaker hood cars on 70 Hemi Cudas, blue interior, blue painted roof, exceptionally rare. Now, because this is an ultra rare car all on its own merit, I documented everything on this car when I took it apart. And frankly, I'm going to really hold Will's hand to the fire to make sure it gets done exactly the way the manufacturer did, whether it was right or wrong, it's still gonna be factory. With this Hemi Cuda, it's one of the rarest cars we've ever done, and I'm super excited to do it. It goes EW1, the Alpine White, with the B5 top, which is the blue fire. And it's actually a painted roof that's going B5 blue, which is a factory option. So I'm just getting ready to wipe down this Hemi Cuda. I'm gonna put a little color on this thing, get her all done. Hi, Anthony. Get her all ready. I can't chalk you. 
So enter the problem that I have. Mark has to always get his two cents in everywhere. What's going on? How you doing? Good, how are you? Getting ready to do a little jam work there? Yeah, just trying to get her done. Okay. The boss right. wants her done. Okay, all right. You, you know uh, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no problem. We're gonna jam the old thing EW1, huh? Himikuda, that's oh, a yeah. good thing. Oh yeah, yeah, beautiful car. Yeah. So the whole idea that I'm trying to mug the camera, that's why I go in there. I can go on camera anytime I want to, I own the show. My job is to make sure that car gets done right. I don't have all that much faith in Will training him on key things like making sure the two-tone lines are in the right place. Yeah, already. Now, where are you at right now? Are you, what, you're, I see you're tacking it off, so you've yeah, prepped yeah. everything and are ready yeah, yeah. to go. It's gonna going to go on, single stage? Yeah, yeah. It's going along great. Getting ready to put down some color and, you know, get her done this week. If you would just let me train my guys the way I want to train my guys without interrupting me, we'd be doing great. And it turns out right now, Count Chocula is in Mark's crosshairs. Got a second? Um, Will's been your trainer for quite a while, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's been doing great. Um, you ever heard of a thing called a tiny? It is so dumb. Now, now he's got Count saying thiny. And that is, that goes back so many years with Mark. And for some reason, he just hangs on to it. I, I hate the word thiny. It's not even a word. I hate when Mark uses it. And I hate the fact that he's got one of my guys using it now. A thiany Dang. is an area that you can see here that is all smooth still, little areas where you can still see the primer and the paints are shiny. Ah. We call them thiannies. Oh, okay. Now, what the is problem that? is if you paint over those, they're going to peel later. Right. I know Will gets bent out of shape when Mark gets involved, but honestly, it's Mark's shop and he signs my check. So I'm with Mark on this. And you just said you're tacking it off to get rid of the paint. It. Were you done or did you have more scuffing to do? Uh, I was just gonna stop right there, right by the thinies and stuff, you know? You're gonna stop by the thinies? Yeah. Why not get the thinies and then you don't have to stop? Right. I cannot honestly tell you what Will's fetish is about shinies or thinies, as I make him say out here. The thing about Chocula is he listens. He gets along with people. He wants to do better. He's not so stuck in his ways. His egos aren't writing checks. His body can't cash as they say in Top Gun, right? He's here to help us do the best job we possibly can. So I'll get him to a point where he hates thinies. Hate them. So I really want to beat into your head no thinies. Oh. You shouldn't be tacking anything down until all the thinies are oh. gone. See, right. I see thinies. My job isn't hard because I paint million dollar cars or we do this show for you people at home. It's just hard because of Mark. 100% Mark. Yeah, he may have missed a few spots, but he's got 25 years of paint experience. So oh. he gets it all. I didn't know Oh, it. well, so the, the paint will know that. No, because what happens is he gets it all ready, and then I'll come in to go over the car, and then we'll discuss it. You're the, the final set eye. Yeah. Like I was saying. And the worst part is I find myself explaining stuff to him, and I shouldn't have to explain stuff to him. What's one of the things he does when he gets rid of the paint? Before he paints it, what's one of the key things to do? Is it to remove thineth? Well, he waxes and greases it. I want you to say, it. I will always remove thineth. <laughs> Don't. I will always remove thineth. 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 See, this is where you get like a new guy. <laughs> no, it's not a new guy. It's just you've been training him wrong, and I just want to make sure. No, Another I, thing, I, I, too. So after all of Mark's silliness was over, Count was able to go in there, get the roof prepped so I can get the two-tone done. So get it all ready to go. Double check you have no shinies. You mean the thinies? I got two of you now. Where are you going? No, you're on your own. You're my boss. Boss! So right now we're getting this roof all waxed and greased. It gets all the chemicals and he Thing that contaminates it would cause a problem in your paint job. Getting all that wiped nice and spotless so that way I can come in and start laying the B5 blue down on this car, which is a super, super cool car. Not to beat a dead horse, but we have never done, as I said, a V02 car, a painted two-tone roof before. So I took lots of photos. I documented everything. I measured everything. I wanted to make sure that whether it was right or wrong, like I said, we put the lines back where the manufacturer put the lines. That's the point. This car is too rare and too desirable and too many people watching on it 
not to do it to perfection. I know we'll obviously only, only do Mopars, and a lot of it's kind of redundant from time to time. This is a definitely like a one-off car, and we'll probably never see another one like it again. So yeah, anyway. Stop where you're at. God just hates me, that's what it is. How do you know that's exactly where that line goes? It looks like from the factory that they did draw it right between the Right, the because hole. I did what you told me to do. Yeah, I well, I don't see the moldings. Can I finish talking? Yeah. So I grabbed the moldings, set the moldings up there, ran a piece of three quarter underneath it, pulled the moldings back off, and then ran the quarter inch fine line on top of it. So you put the moldings in place, Yeah. and then you masked up to Two. it, Right. And then you pull the molding off and you win another quarter of an inch. Yep, exactly. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Do you mind if I just double check the moldings real quick? No, know? I do mind because there's no need. I've already done that. The what? There's no need. We've already done I that. need to double check them right now. So who's got them? Bob always said truth bears investigation. Well, they're inside the car, so. They're where? They're inside the car. So if I open that up. Yeah, they're behind this inside yeah. the car, but we're about ready to paint. Okay. What's that over there? You know, I struggled in school, had a super hard time with it. So I knew college was not gonna be an option. So I thought, pick a trade. Met Mark, turned out to be a great job, make good money, take care of my family, paint cars. Thought that would be enough. Having a hard time finding the hole? It's not what your girlfriend said. I think I should've went back to school. So after Mark's next round of time wasting and foolishness again, We're finally able to regroup with the camera guys, get in there and get the car painted. So you and I are gonna talk. But, but doesn't that not sound fun? Nope, it sounds like you're gonna start filming at 4 a.m. again. This is that crazy I tell you guys about. So at this point, I have to go back in the booth, get it masked up again, and then start this whole process over. So with this, you know, despite what Mark says or what Mark thinks, we treat every car the same, whether it's a million dollar car or a $50,000 car. The first thing I do is I do two coats of sealer just to ensure that we don't have any scratches or anything Count might have missed. You can fix it in the sealer. All right, so we got everything sealed on the roof of this car. Now it's going to be five blue. We always want to shake up our metallics to make sure the metallics are broken down, not sticking together at all. So we'll shake this for just a few seconds. Then we'll go over there, pour the paint, and start making it blue. Y'all do five, five good coats on it and then two drop coats, just to make sure the metallic lays out nice and even. Then once that's all dried and ready for clear, we'll go back in there, do our three coats of clear like we would on a car, let it sit overnight, then tomorrow we'll start wrapping up the body, which is 90% ready to go. A few little touch-ups on the body. We'll mask it up so we can hopefully get the white shot this week also. So you will have wonderful after shots. Listen, I know Will's a great painter. I taught him everything he knows. I will admit that the cars that come out beautiful, but they don't always come out beautiful on their own merit. Me being involved, looking over his shoulder, making sure he dots his I's and crosses his T's, if you will, is how we end up with perfect paint jobs. So just remember that when you're saying, oh, what a great painter he is. Oh, do I go too far sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Do I do I cross the line myself? Hell yeah, I do. All right. But in the automotive OEM restoration world, details matter. Still to come. It's well over a million dollar payoff. Will this high value CUDA force Mark to crank up the intensity? Put it right on the line. I don't know if we can't see the line or what the problem is. My threshold for craziness is a lot lower than it used to be. Will pressure in paint spill over to the rest of the team? Mark's been leaning on Will extra heavy lately, so Will's been leaning on me a lot heavier. So you haven't put the correct date for the ones on yet? I haven't?
So we always use our DCU 2002, four to one to one with the DCX61 885 reducer. Three coats of clear and we're done. To put things a little bit in perspective for you Chevy and Ford lovers out there when it comes to rarity, they made 368 70 Hemi Cuda hardtops with an automatic transmission. Rumor on the street, known to exist, there were only 100 Cuda models with a V02 painted roof. In 1970, if you had picked out that car and selected V02 painted roof, it would have cost you $31.70. So considering today, that one option alone makes this a one of one car. It's well over a million dollar payoff on a $31 investment. That's a good investment. So now that the roof is completely done in the B5 blue, we will put the car back in the booth, mask off the roof, get the car masked up, shoot it to EW1 Alpine white, and we'll be done. So I've been working with my handsome cousin, Doug, here. Good looking haircut, by the way. Well, thank you. Looking good, nice thank mustache, you. yeah. Yep. We need to get this engine running because Will has been working really hard to get the car painted, right? He's been pushing me hard. I know Will and I give each other a lot of crap, but Mark's been leaning on Will extra heavy lately, so Will's been leaning on me a lot heavier. My job is to make sure the drivetrain is ready to go in the car the minute it hits the assembly floor. And I've been pushing you hard to make yeah. sure that the K-member and transmission and everything are put together and it's in a running position. Is that yes. fair to say? That is fair to say. All right. Is this thing going to start up if you got the distributor in correctly? Yes. Did you put the Classic Industries date coated spark plug wires on it? Because if they're going to fail or if they're going to work, I want to know what the actual ones, not engine test run ones. These are the actual wires. And what is the date code on that? 1130 of 7, H3070. So you haven't put the correct date coded ones on yet? I haven't. He's as surprised that he didn't put the wires on there that I asked him to do as I am. Because in his mind, he put those wires on there. Well, the car's a 70 Cuda and it was built in 69. So unless Marty McFly went and got <laughs> these plug wires and put them on later, those still haven't been done. Okay. You know, I, I love Doug and I do my best to, to tolerate the rascal, you know? He, I think at the end of the day, it's like his elevator maybe just isn't making it to that top floor. Doesn't matter, we're out of time. We need to get this thing right. Hey, look. Whoa. Recognize the scene? I do. Recognize it? Uh-huh. What's the scene? I don't know. You just said you knew. It's Rocky. It's Rambo. Rambo. It's John Rambo, John J. Rambo. I never saw the movie. You saw First Blood. How do you know? We watched it together on a laser disc. That's how I know. Oh, okay. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with my elevator, okay? It makes all the stops. It's just sometimes I don't push all the buttons. Can we run this engine? Yes, let's all do. Right. Why don't we Please. why don't we just start by cranking the engine over and finding out if it'll really turn over. And if it really turns over, then we will check and see if there's fuel. And then if there's fuel, we'll check and see if there's spark and then we'll try to fire it. So please crank the engine over. Crank's Cranking nice over. too, actually. It has good even compression. We did not build this engine. The owner of the car sent the engine, had it built somewhere else because he had owned it for years, been collecting parts for it. Had the engine built and sent out to us, we had a little bit of detailing to do to it or will have to do to it before it's done. One thing I do know about the inside of the engine is he put one of the mother thumper cams in it. So it's gonna have a nice bump to it when it's done. I've gotten to a point where I'm loving all of our old cars now with the old school muscle sound, even if it's not OEM. Okay, we have gas, we have spark, we have compression. Let's fire this mother biscuit up. Let's hear that mobile thumping cam. Do it, Dougie, I got faith in you. Will's finishing painting that car this week. Now this thing better run. And Doug gave us a dead battery. We got the roof on this car done last week in the B5 blue, came out great. Still needs to be cut and buff, but we'll address that when we do the car. So at this point, the roof is dry. We've got the roof masked off. Now we're actually ready to go in and do four coats of our Alpine white single stage. 
Then we'll let that sit. All you people at home will tune back in. And then at that point, you're gonna see a beautiful blue roof, white car, all buffed out. So I think it's really gonna pop. It's really gonna stand out. Mopar was crazy back in the day. Off the wall color matches and vinyl tops and stuff they did. It's cool to actually be able to do that now being this is the first time it's ever come through. All right, so right now I'm just checking out the Hemi Cuda. This is the V02 car that got the blue painted top. You guys recall I came in and I talked to him about making sure that the two-tone line was perfectly in sync with the original two-tone line. You know, I, I get the car in the booth ready to go, and it's like round number five of Mark coming in and starting in with this silliness and setbacks and hogging the camera and everything I complain about every season. And it looks like he's done that. And what you have to do is after you get that blue painted, which came out very, very nice, you have to reverse mask it. Now he has to mask off that roof in the exact same spot. So I'm just making sure he is ready for final paint. Everything looks real nice on this side here. That side does not. See, I'm seeing a blue line. That's not fine line. That's actually B5 blue. So all you gotta do, this is so weird. You wanna cover this right here, okay? Put it right on the line. I don't know if he can't see the line or what the problem is. This stuff stretches. It rolls around the edge really nicely. And you can just duplicate exactly what was there, which is very important to do. The one thing I've noticed over the years, you know, my threshold for craziness is a lot lower than it used to be. What was it that Jack Nicholson said, as good as it gets? Oh, I know. It's so crazy somewhere else. We're all stocked up. You need to get some fine line, man. See, I, what I don't understand is why you wouldn't have gone exactly on the blue line like we had talked about, because you made a nice blue line, right? I do. Why wasn't it fine lined out? Now, you see, I've, I've had to cover this up. Yeah, because you're doing it wrong. Oh, it's wrong to go on the exact two-tone line? Because you said to me, yeah. so why did you put the two-tone line where you put it then? So at this point, we're going to go ahead. Mark's going to go back to the office. We're going to wipe the whole car down. I'll cut the <coughs> fine line run it around the blue line, and then start painting. Okay, welcome back. We have a freshly charged battery. Thank you, Doug, for that. That was fun, fun for everybody. I would like to try to start this engine again. Do you remember why? Yeah, because we're in a hurry. Thank you. pushing me. And uh, Thank you're, you very you're much. You're pushing me. Great, good. So I have full confidence in you. Let's, let's <laughs> can this mother biscuit off. Oh man, you ready? Yeah. Here we go. Hey. How about okay, that? Okay, let me turn the exhaust on. How about that? It runs. Okay, let's fire this mother biscuit up. Timmy's like fuel, don't they? Yes, they do. Nice. Look at that. Oh, I don't like that. Let's try it again. Pretty good initial startup, though. Pretty good. Nice. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> The engine fired up really nice. The accelerator pumps in the carb seemed to be a little dried out, so we had to prime it a few times. Overall, a great success, and it ran good. All right. Look for oil leak. Okay. Oil leak. Okay. The reason we run these on the engine run stand is it gives us an opportunity to put everything on the engine that's gonna be on it when it goes in the car, but without all of the hassle of it being in the car. So we can start it, run it, set the timing on it, adjust the carburetors, look for oil leaks. Rear main seal gonna leak, front seal gonna leak, what's gonna leak? Something's gonna leak, especially being a Hemi, because they leak inherently from the factory. So when you see my hand over the top of it, I'm kind of playing with it, lifting it off and, and setting it back down. I'm choking it, so to speak, not as dramatically as closing the butterfly would do or putting my hand on it, but I'm restricting it so I can feel the air. 
it allows me to be able to set that carburetor exactly where I want it, let off, set it, almost emulate what it's gonna be like when the choke is fully open. So it's just a little tuning technique that I use, and for the most part, overall, it sets it up pretty right. Yeah. So the good news is the Hemi started up and ran great. No oil leaks, no overheating, a real success. The bad news is that put Mark in a good mood. And that's when he starts all these crazy references. I like it. You ever see the original Rocky? Yeah. 18 times at the Fine Arts Theater. Remember when Mickey Mick. came over to Rocky's apartment to Mick. try to talk him into letting him be his manager? Yeah. After just kicking him out of the gym, saying he was a... Uh, 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 a bum. A bum. A bum. Uh-huh. What was Rocky wearing in that scene? I make no apologies for being goofy and silly and having fun and dancing and singing and making rhymes and movie quotes because I think that keeping spirits up, keeping morale up, especially during a time when something has to be done, has to be done in a short period of time, I think it's a good thing. Rocky Balboa. A sweater. Yeah. A tan sweater. Yeah. Tell the people about it. Tell the people about it. The sweater. I don't know if I can say that Tell on it. camera. Okay. So Rocky was wearing a heavy tan sweater, right? By now you'd think I'd be used to all of Mark's crazy insanity. I mean, we grew up together, but I think some things in life aren't meant to be understood. Hey, yo, yo, Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> Why you laughing? That's a good sweater right there. Oh, look at you. That's the sweater he was wearing. The greatest thing that's happened to me in the last 10 years in, in this crazy world I live in is the Rocky Balboa shop. Not, no, by the way, folks, I don't get anything from Rocky Balboa or Sylvester Stallone. I just happen to be a fan. Got a website, you go in there, it's official stuff, right? So you see my fedora? That is an official Rocky Balboa fedora. You see the jacket? Official, okay? So in the case of the sweater, they just came out with that sweater. I always thought that was an ugly sweater. I don't even know why it's, I showed it to my sister and she goes, you're the only person in the world who'll know what that is. I disagree. I think a few people other than myself will recognize it. Rocky looked darn good in it, you know, and I like to think I didn't look too bad either when I wore it. You can see I'm, I'm getting huge now. I've been lifting a lot. Spent a lot of time at the gym, kind of cut down, getting more of my V shape back to me. So Rocky's right. It's not about how hard you can hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. See, that's how win is done. Going to the show, huh? 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 Are you huh? a side of beef? Are what? you a side of beef? No, I'm not a side of beef. Hey, you want me to try your brother? I'll try your brother. Hey, you want me? Your business with me. Call to you later. The only thing that makes Mark's tolerable, it's non-exclusive. He lays it on everybody. It's not just me. And right now, it's Doug. I think you've been practicing that, right? <laughs> it's Rocky, man. Yeah. The boy. Even got the little bit of black shirt on underneath it. Boy, it's good. How you doing? <laughs> Shut it off. Shut it off. Kill it. You want to ruin my Rocky thing? Hey, kid. You know what happened to you? I, I, I was a freak. You know, you need a trainer. You need a manager. I don't need nobody. A bad man. Meatball, meatball. I kind of come in here in the <laughs> gym sometimes and I like to just kind of punch the beef like that, you know? And you go, hoo, hoo, hoo. I start cracking the ribs, you know? Yo, it's ribs! <laughs> All right, we got work to do. Well, lucky for me, when Mark's out doing torture and Doug, doing all that crazy stuff with Doug, he's not here. So I was able to carry on with my job and get the car painted.
coming up. I'm always willing to put up with Mark's crazy goofiness because he's actually one of the most knowledgeable Mopar folks on the planet. Well, Mark's overconfidence set up his team for failure. They can work together and I'll just keep you guys entertained. When a high value Hemi meets a higher value Cuda. Mark can be merciless when somebody makes a mistake. Will Mark be the one who slips up? I think you're getting close to that frame rail there, aren't you? Shift to the driver's side an inch. I can tell you about measuring it. Okay, for two, it's the wrong direction, Mark. How many things can go wrong? Unlimited. And when Mark reveals a secret he's been keeping under wraps. Nobody's allowed to open the hood. Nobody's allowed to look at it. How will the team react? I hear something roaring. What is that god awful <laughs> noise? What the hell is that? When Great Yard Cars returns. heard us use the term hemi suspension all the time. Right, right. So one thing just to say, we call it hemi suspension. So Mark had me help install the drivetrain on the hemi CUDA, which was great. It's actually the first time I got to install a complete drivetrain here at Graveyard Cars. And I had a lot of questions. Other cars had them too. If you had a, a 70 or 71 E-body with a 440, okay. 444 barrel, they would also have what we call hemi suspension. Now listen, I do like to have fun, but I like to educate at the same time on a serious note. Brian is pretty new here. Doug does this every day, but he doesn't remember what he does. So I just want to take a few minutes on the uh, Dana rear end and talk about things, right? Data, right? Information, numbers. People always say, how do you know all those numbers? Because I, I keep them fresh in my head. So whether you're talking about the 3400, 024, 034 leaf spring, for the e-body, you know, Dana rear ends or Hemi suspension, these are things that they can learn too. And there's a lot more details that go along with it. If you're looking at a rear axle assembly out there on the rack, I can tell you if it's a B-body or an e-body without measuring it, as long as there's leaf springs on it. I can tell you what year it is within one to two years. And I can tell you whether the car had disc brakes or not. All from a rear axle, that's what you wanna learn. In a 70 and 71 e-body, what that means, on the back end is the leaf springs, okay. okay? On a 70 to 71, it's a total of six spring stacks. So you got six over here, six over here. The interesting thing to look for when you're out back just trying to find, how would I know that, is just the part number down here. In this case, you notice how this leaf goes towards the back of the car? Right. And over here, where the number 3400-024 goes towards the front of the car. That's the quickest way to tell an E-body. It's weird. One goes towards the back, one goes towards huh. the front. And a B-body Hemi suspension is a seven and a six stack. They actually have an extra half spring on the right-hand okay. side. This is a great example of why I'm always willing to put up with Mark's crazy goofiness. Because he's actually one of the most knowledgeable Mopar folks on the planet. And I can learn a whole lot from him. So on an automatic transmission car, it's A32. The code for a super track back on an automatic is A32, even though this looks identical to an A34 car setup. No difference at all in them, except that when it's A32, it tells the assembly line it's going into an automatic car. When it's A34, it's going into a four-speed okay, car. Okay, now what exactly is Super Track Pack? With Super Track Pack, you'll automatically get 10-inch rear drums, okay. which we have right there. You'll also get mandatory power front disc brakes. Okay. Whereas if it was an A33 car, say it was a, just a Track Pack, four-speed mm -hmm. car, you could get 11 inch drums manual even all mm. the way around. Okay. So the super track pack is the axle package to have. It's gonna give you the 410 Dana, it's gonna give you power disc brakes, max cooling. All of the Hemi suspensions have the heavier bars on them, torsion bars, so the 780 and the 781. Also on a Dana, there are always three bolt pinion snubbers. Okay. And you can't mistake a Dana because of the 10 bolt rear cover off. Right. All right, so we're ready to put this in? I think yes, so. We are. All right, let's yeah. take some nuts off and get this thing rolled around. All right. All right, you ready, Dougie? Yeah. 
I am ready. That's the way they're supposed to fall in. Go ahead and get a couple of those nuts as far as you can by hand in there. All right. And then what we do is lower the car down so that we can put the shackles in. Got a rookie and an old salty dog here doing it. Why did you back into my hand? I was patting you on the back and now I packed you on the head. Are, are you the old salty dog, Dougie? Salty dog. <laughs> okay, the top ones are tight. Okay. Going down. I'm hand down. tightened. Yep. Perfect. It really doesn't require three guys to do this, but Brian is new, hasn't really done any suspension stuff. He does our assemblies. Doug's done it forever, so they can work together and I'll just keep you guys entertained. Can I, you want me to raise this up? You guys got your nuts started? You can put it up where it's a little easier to work on if you'd like. Sounds good. All right, just finish tightening those down and then we'll move to the front. I really enjoyed working with Brian. He always wants to learn something new, and that's a great skill set to have around here. There Perfect. She goes. Okay, we got one side on. All right. All right. Rear end is installed. It is. Good job, Dougie. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for showing me this. You're welcome. My pleasure, man. Yeah. First Hemi engine install for you? Absolutely. Is that true? Yeah. Doug, yeah. how many for you? Quite a few. You had three or four, right? Yeah. This is a manual steering car, so we're hoping that it will go up in there and we can favor it ever so slightly into the hole without scuffing the inner fender and the valve cover or scratching the left hand frame rail and the inner fender. Do you feel good about that? I do. I do, yeah. Now, what I've learned over the years is one of the hardest drivetrains to install is the Hemi because it's so big. They call it the elephant, right? This is a Hemi Cuda just like Wendell's 1971 Hemi Cuda was. Now, there's a difference here in that this is a manual steering car. And we have learned historically that when that power steering gear is on the K-member, it's much more difficult to squeeze in there because it protrudes past where the frame rail would go. And that's why you usually have to cock it as it goes up in there give it an angle and then raise it in. So I am anxious to see if this one doesn't go in a whole lot easier, even though it is a Hemi. You guys ready to try this? Yes. Yeah, let's do it. We're ready. Okay, here we go, yo. Okay, here we go, yo. It's the wrong direction, Mark. He's aiming right for me, you notice that? I noticed. Right there. I think you're getting close to that frame rail there, aren't you? Very close. Everything clear on your side? Yeah. Shift to the driver's side. An inch. Okay. You got plenty of room you over got, there? You got two inches, yeah. Two inches. Up. Straight up. Oh, we're looking good over here. Looking good over here. Nice. Is there really that much room? Yeah, you can come my way an inch. Mark is right about these elephant engines. When they have a power steering, they're a lot harder, but this one had a manual steering, and it went in, it was a dream fit. I mean, I had Brian with me. He was able to watch one side and I watched the other. So that was really helpful. Yeah, but yeah, it was a smooth install. Going, shifting driver's side. Good. That's good. Okay, now Going I'm clear. Up. Yep. You got clearance, Brian? Boy, it's tight, but I think so. Good. Good. It's gonna be pretty close, I mean, without taking this long bolt Brian, off. Brian, is, is your front bolt, is the K-member too far forward or too far back? It's too forward? far back now. So go to the transmission at the back and push the back of it that way and it'll bring the it'll bring K-member forward. When Dougie told me how difficult these Hemis can be because of their size, I had my mind set on making sure my side did not get damaged. <laughs> because as you know, Mark can be merciless when somebody makes a mistake. But hey, this thing just fell into place. Am I okay height-wise? Can I shut this off? Yep. All right, ladies, how we doing? Looking pretty good. It's talking to you, Doug. I apologize. Called me a lady. Doug, what's this old beautiful white car remind you of? What famous movie car, sir? Vanishing Point. Vanishing Point. Yeah, it didn't have a Cuda in it. it. Had a Challenger in it. It was white, no, no VO2 blended, painted top, but. Uh, no, there is no famous movie car with a white 70 Hemi Cuda in it. It was a trick question just that's as old Dougie was at in reality today. If this was who wants to be a millionaire, your final answer was 
vanishing point. Yeah. So my advice is, next time you phone a friend, don't call Brian. <laughs> <laughs> call, call me or Tony D'Agostino. <laughs> yeah, we'll call Mark oh, yeah. for abuse. For yeah, you doing abuse. good? Yeah, we're doing great. Oh man, that is awesome. Okay, so we got our rear bolts in place. Yeah. We need to get our front bolts in the K-member. And to do that, I'm gonna drop the car down about two inches. Okay. <clears throat> Where did our forklift driver go? Sir. Now y'all wondering why I'm wearing my Kowalski shirt. So Dougie comes up with this crazy idea that a white Cuda is a white Challenger. I, I, I love him, right? Again, what button do you hit, right? <laughs> On the selector. I thought this was a great opportunity, talking about Kowalski, talking about Vanishing Point, talking about the cars to get a very special surprise that I've had out back. Everybody's been asking about it. Nobody's allowed to open the hood. Nobody's allowed to look at it. I brought it around. I wanted to see their initial reaction to this. Okay, we got the engine in. Yeah, what do you say we get some wheels on this thing? Let's put the wheels on. Like a glove. Nice working out the boss here, huh? It is nice. It feels real smooth at this point. Real smooth. Do you guys hear that? I hear something roaring. What is that god awful noise? What the noise? hell is that? What is this? <laughs> Look at this. Oh my god. <laughs> that dirty Mary crazy alert. Remember that? Uh-huh. Remember the cop cars in that? We haven't had a cop car in a long time. No, we haven't. I didn't think we did. Remember the one that was all built up that was gonna chase down old Dirty Larry, Crazy Mary? Oh yeah. What was it? Cornet four-door. Four-door Cornet. I think it might have been a Polaris, but I don't actually remember because it's been a long time since I saw that movie. What do you think we got in this thing? Probably 318. 318, yeah. Sure. 318. Yeah. Whoa. Huh. What is that? Remember the car in the movie? Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, this one, 426 cubic inch nightmare, 525 horsepower, 727 Man. torque flight with a 3000 RPM stall That's converter, crazy. Dana 60 yes. with 410 gears, manual steering and manual brakes on a 72 Dodge Coronet. Wow. Well, I don't care about any of that. What's the top speed? Top speed? Yeah. Unlimited. So after all that, folks, at the end of the week, we've got a 1970 Hemi Cuda with a V02 painted roof, might be a St. Louis Blues car, might be a Sox and Martin car, might not, but it is still a one of one V02 EW1 Alpine White 1970 Hemi Cuda. Take a step back, look at the side of it, take it all in, because it's a stunning car and it's what we do at Great American Cars. Top speed, unlimited.